Hello and welcome to this online webinar, COPD, the Gold Guideline 2023 update, brought to you by SBK Healthcare and taken place on Monday the 17th of April 2023. To view more of our educational resources, including webinars, workshops and conferences, please do visit our SBK website at www.sbk-healthcare.co.uk. Thank you. Okay, so today we have 40 minutes, which is not a lot of time, but as Emma said, you will be receiving all of these slides and the talk is recorded. So don't fret too much. I may skip over some of the, some of the slides, um, or I, you know, and you'll be able to, as I say, you'll be able to receive those later. We are going to work through the following objectives in this session. We're going to review the 2023 Gold Report guidelines. And in particular, what I'm going to do in this session is enable you to, I'm going to highlight to you the updates um, and the proposed change in the definition of COPD. I'll also make an assessment with reference to primary care of the Gold Report. And I particularly want us to be um, more familiar, perhaps, with the non-pharmacological treatments that are now highly prevalent in the gold report and we will also review the statements uh, regarding palliative care considerations in COPD. So it's the gold COPD 2023 report. This is the website, it's a very it's a superb website, um, you can download the report, you can see um, a document regarding the key changes, there's pocket guide and you can also purchase the guide. So you have um, many, many resources at the goldcopd.org uh, site. Now, I want, as I say, I think it's really important that you're, we, we've got the gist of what's been changed. So there is a very comprehensive document outlining, outlining the changes. But in chapter one, I think one of the most important things is that a new definition has been, of COPD has been proposed. And there's also a table with um, a proposed taxonomy for COPD. So we'll have a look at those. It's worth noting as well that 387 new references have been included in the document. And I have to say, as a resource for up-to-date relevant references on COPD, you really can't get anything better than this gold report. So the new definition now um, emphasizes the disease symptoms, and they want to do this really to prompt earlier diagnosis of COPD. So the new definition states that COPD is a heterogeneous lung condition. This is also um, a feature of the new guide of the new definition because they really want us to be recognizing how different COPD can be um, in different populations. It's characterized by chronic respiratory symptoms and they've outlined outlining the symptoms now. And that's so that in primary care, you can begin to pick up on COPD at a much earlier stage, dyspnea, cough, sputum production, and or exacerbation. And it's due to abnormalities of the airways and or the alveoli that, that cause persistent, often progressive airflow obstruction. The last, the older definition talked about um, the causes of COPD, noxious gases and particles, but this one doesn't so much focus on the causes of COPD, particularly but, um, mainly because there's been an overemphasis of COPD caused by smoking with, to the detriment perhaps of people understanding or recognizing that COPD, particularly in um, poor, poorer countries, COPD can be caused by wood burning and other such situations, environmental situations. So we have the um, clinical indicators, which you can all be familiar with, of, see, of a diagnosis, making a diagnosis, you know. So and so walks into the clinic and says, oh, I'm really breathless. And it, it, we all know COPD patients, and if they, they all say, oh, I'm fine when I'm on the flat. It's when I go up hills or stairs that I'm breathless. And for me, that's, you know, if I had a penny for every time somebody's told me that. Um, recurrent wheeze, chronic cough, recurrent lower respiratory tract infections. So consider the diagnosis and the recommendation, the emphasis is then to perform spirometry. 
Um, we've got some diagnostic criteria and pre-COPD that's now been mentioned, um, talked about in these guidelines. And I think this is a really important move because, again, the guidelines are trying to push us towards earlier diagnosis of COPD. And in fact, you may see patients who um, actually don't have COPD as confirmed by a spirometry FEV1, FVC ratio of less than 70%. But in fact, they do have some structural lesions that may be picked up on CT scan, such as emphysema or gas trapping or hyperinflation. The term PRISM, preserved ratio impaired spirometry, can also be um, picked up nowadays with spirometry. And this is being proposed to identify those with a normal ratio for abnormal spirometry. So, um, for instance, you may find some patients on spirometry who have um, a, a reduced FEV 2575, but actually the ratio is still intact and above 70%. And for these people, we're going to be coining the phrase PRISM. And of course, these people are going to be at risk of COP. And these, I mean, if you do pick these people up, these are going to be so, 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 so susceptible for any smoking intervention programs that you might have available. The taxonomy is interesting and I think quite useful for us to remind us that COPD, that smoking is not the only cause of COPD. Um, we have the genetically determined COPD. I've got a friend out here in Spain, she's 49, and she has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency COPD. So she would be COPD G, genetically determined. Interestingly, she's having fantastic, incredible results with um, infusion of alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is you know, unusual for, to have such positive benefits. Her lung function has gone from 30% to 70%, so it's great, amazing. You have environmental COPD, you have abnormal lung development, you have COPD that's due to infections, COPD and asthma, and COPD of unknown cause. Now, in the previous guidelines we talked about, or it was talked about um, ACOG, ACOS, first of all, and also ACO, A-C-O. So that was asthma and COPD overlap syndrome. <laughs> I did have a bit of a laugh when I saw asthma and COPD overlap syndrome and thought it would have been funny if they'd have called it COPD and asthma overlap syndrome, because then of course it would have been chaos. <laughs> but they didn't, probably for that reason. However, now the guidelines are trying to steer us away from this and what they're really much more interested in us is identifying asthma and then treating the asthma accordingly and then adding in any COPD medications that might be necessary. Ah, here we go, yes. Um, we no longer refer to asthma COPD overlap. We emphasize that asthma and COPD are different disorders. They may coexist. If a concurrent diagnosis of asthma is suspected, pharmacotherapy should primarily follow asthma guidelines but pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches may also be needed for the COPD. The severity of COPD, as always, is determined by spirometry. So once we've established that there's airflow obstruction with an FEV1, FVC ratio of less than 70%, we then go on to look at um, FEV1% predicted. It is more than 80, we're talking mild, um, between uh, less than 80, but more than 50. Sorry, less than 80 and um, just over 50, between 50 and 80, we're talking moderate. Uh, 30 to 50, we're talking severe, and less than 30% predicted, we're talking very severe. They just report in the guidelines that they want us to um, not to mix up the terminology of mild COPD with that of early COPD. Um, sometimes people refer to early COPD as mild, and the point is that actually early COPD um, is an early diagnosis and may not always be mild, particularly if this was somebody who had an abnormal lung development initially, so perhaps very, very small lungs initially, um, and then went on to contract COP, they may actually, their first presentation may be moderate. The 23 Gold Committee has made a big focus again on exacerbations. I think for the medical practitioners, those of you who are prescribers, and all of us working with COPD patients, we have to be really mindful of the absolute um, catastrophic nature of repeated exacerbations in COPD. 
the deterioration in quality of life, the deterioration in, um, in respiratory parameters, and obviously the risk and the increased mortality after exacerbations. So what they've now done is they used to have the ABCD group, but they've um, clarified this and put them down into just an A, B and an E group. And I'll show you this. So do not think any more of the ABCD. We're now talking A, B, E. So we make our com confirmation of um, COPD with our FED, FEC ratio. We then do the assessment of the airflow obstruction and the grading, the gold grading. And then we're going to look at the exacerbation history. Now, more than two moderate exacerbations or even just one exacerbation in a year that leads to hospitalization. And we are going to call these patients E. These are going to be our E group. One or no moderate exacerbations that do not lead to hospitalization. And they will be either an A or a B, depending on their scores on the modified uh, MRC breathlessness questionnaire and on a CAT questionnaire. And I will show you both of those questionnaires in a moment. So important to remember this. E, basically, we've got, you know, you see anybody who's hospitalized with an exacerbation, they are in the E group. Anybody who's mild with very few symptoms, they are an A group and B is more severe symptoms. All the group A patients should be offered bronchodilator treatment based on its effect on breathlessness, either a short or a long acting bronchodilator. So bronchodilator for A. Usually we're looking at um, a, a LAVA, a long acting bronchodilator, uh, but if patients are very, very, are only sporadically, occasionally breathless, then a short, bronchodilator may be useful. Group B, so these are patients with more severe symptoms, should be started on a LAVA, um, a long-acting bronchodilator, beta agonist, and LAMA, a uh, long-acting muscarinic. So this is the combination for your group B patients. Now, um, if your patient has less than one moderate exacerbation in the study, um, and a cat of higher than 10, then LAVA LAMA is known to be superior to LAMA uh, than LAMA alone. So we're really looking at combination therapy. Now we've got our group with um, exacerbations. We're looking at LAVA and LAMA again. The use of LAVA and ICS inhaled corticosteroids is not encouraged. If there is an indication, and I will talk in a moment about the indications for inhaled corticosteroids, then the lava lama and inhaled corticosteroids is the better option, a preferred choice. So we want a combination lava lama and inhaled corticosteroids in group E. But the recommendation at the moment is that this should really only be um, considered automatically at least in patients with eosinophils more than 300. So eosinophils obviously they're fairly easy to measure. Um, they are, they can be quite um, um, uh, variable. They can change quite a lot over course, so over a period of time. So um, there is a recommendation to measure them more than once. I think this is going to be a controversial recommendation myself. Um, but that's, you know, the, the encouragement now is really to only use the inhaled corticosteroids in, in patients where the eosinophils are more than 300. If the patient has concomitant asthma, then obviously they're treated with asthma, so they should be using an ICS as well. Here we go. Lava Lama for your exacerbators, uh, bronchodilator for your you know, minimal symptom patients, and a Lava Lama for your group B. Now, these are the factors to consider when initiating um, inhaled corticosteroid treatment. Yes, really think about using them if there is a history of hospitalizations. Think about adding them in if there's more than two moderate exacerbations a year. Definitely add them in if the blood is in the fills are more than 300. And obviously, as I said, if there's a history of or concomitant asthma. Yes, you can consider them if there's been one moderate exacerbation of COPD despite appropriate long-acting bronchodilator maintenance therapy. And you can consider them, if there's still problems, if the blood eosinophils are between 100 and 300. 
Now, don't use them, or it's not recommended to use inhaled corticosteroids uh, if there's repeated pneumonia events, if the blood easement fills are less than 100, and if there's a history of bacterial, microbacterial infection. So, I mean, the gold guidelines are very clear about this, how this will translate into practice remains to be seen. This is an example of the modified MRC dyspnea scale. I use this one every day, all the time. And I love this scale. I only get breathless with strenuous exercise. Well, fortunately, that's me. I just climbed a massive hill the other day that was very, very breathless. Uh, a mountain. It was a mountain. I get short of breath when hurrying or walking on the level. Uh, and grade three is I stop for breath after walking. Just note that this is the modified MRC scale so it starts at naught and ends at four whereas the old MRC scale started at one and ended at five that's just just be aware of that the CAT um, CFD assessment tool I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this I also find this super useful um, I find it super useful in pulmonary rehab in breathing retraining programs that I might be doing with patients and again so many times Patients will have a high score on I walk up a hill or flight of stairs, um, very breathless doing those activities. I like the cat very much as well because it helps me identify, identify specifically very quickly and easily where the main patient problem is. Now, obviously, I remember I mentioned PRISM and I mentioned pre-COPD. You have a fantastic opportunity there to get the patient to stop smoking. Um, these new five criteria are something that we should all be doing. We should all ask, systematically identify tobacco users at every visit. We should all be advising to stop, stop patient smoking, assessing their determined uh, willingness and the rationale of their desire. I have, I have, I run a stop smoking service um, and I have a great question, which is, do you want to stop smoking? And you know, often you'll get, no, no, I can't, I really enjoy it, no, no. And then I say, well, if you could, if you really enjoy it that much, do you want to get your kids? Why don't you get your kids smoking again? Um, you, know, you know, you must really think it's such a great thing to do. And if you actually help people identify the cognitive dissonance associated with their smoking, you can really change the way they think about it. Just by saying, just by saying, um, you know, that as soon as they say I love it, it makes me, it makes me relaxed. I really like the taste. Well, if it's that great, are you going to get your kids to do it? Of course they're not. Nobody is. So we can help people change their rationale. We can help people change their willingness with a few cleverly worded questions. And we're going to have to assist patients to stop smoking. And then it's arrange. Ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange. In the guidelines, there is a table 4.2, which um, reviews the major findings and recommendations of uh, of um, the tobacco guide to treating tobacco use guideline. Dependence is a chronic condition, effective treatments. Uh, clinicians need to offer operationalize the consistent identification. Brief smoking cessation counseling can be effective. Strong dose response relation between intensity and tobacco dependence. Now, first line pharmacotherapist for tobacco dependency. Uh, I believe that we can no longer, um, Champex I know is no longer available, uh, but there's nicotine gums, there's um, Bupropion, uh, Zyban, nicotine inhaler, nicotine nasal spray, spray and patches, effective. Now, I am sure that you, like me, saw the government rollout of um, swap your cigarettes for your e-cigarettes. I actually, I am just going to count. I'm not on the fence on this. I think it's atrocious. I think it's absolutely appalling. Um, I'm sure that they have been significantly lobbied by the companies who make these e-cigarettes. You know, as of February 2020, there were 68 deaths that we know were directly associated with e-cigarettes. We know that there are a number of diseases that people are coming down with, respiratory diseases, because of e-cigarettes. I don't think e-cigarettes um, is a helpful, helpful way myself. And certainly the gold report states that there is no evidence that e-cigarettes um, help smoking cessation. So how they got that through, I don't, and they're spending a lot of money on it again. And I'm also just going to mention quickly here 
um, something called cytosine. I'm really sad that cytosine isn't better known. Cytosine is a herbal supplement. It's made from the seeds of the laburnum tree. It works on the receptors in the brain um, in the same way that Zyban and Champex do. However, it has fewer side effects. Um, the main side effect of cytosine is a dry mouth, which actually passes quite quickly in the treatment schedule. Uh, it's very cheap. It's been used for over 60 years in uh, Eastern Europe. There, are, there is good research on the benefit of it, of cytosine. Uh, because it's not a drug, it doesn't require prescription. So non-prescribers like myself can administer it. it can administer, you can buy it online as Tabex. It's called cytosine. I think it's an amazing boom to smoking cessation, but because it's not funded by big companies, uh, there's very little, there is research, research in the New England Journal of Medicine, but there's very little promotion of cytosine. Um, however, I do hear that maybe AstraZeneca or one of the companies are going to start looking into it, so it would be great. So that's just um, putting that one out there, separate from the gold guidelines, but something that I think is worth knowing about. Okay, so more updates in the guidelines. Additional information on screening for COPD and case finding. More information on CTs um, and the table with information on the use of CTs in stable COPD. I won't be going through all of those, but I will have a little chat about um, screening. Uh, the gold recommendation is actually that early case finding is worthwhile. However, mass screening is not recommended. Uh, the effect of screening programs does seems to do little to improve patient outcomes. But case finding, you know, case finding is not that difficult. You know, there is a, there's a, a questionnaire called the um, COPD di Diagnostic um, Questionnaire, CDQ, which is useful and has been used in some studies. I think a very, very simple way of choosing the cat. You have a cat as part of your first assessment when you see your patient. And perhaps they fill in some paperwork also that says whether they're smoking. Let's put it this way. If you see somebody who's got a cat of higher than 10 and they're a heavy smoker, well, you, I think you would be very sensible to do spirometry in that case. Um, yes, it's not worthwhile, obviously, looking at spirometry in asymptomatic in individuals who have no exposure to tobacco or other risk, risk factors. I mean, there is more support now for CT scanning than perhaps there was before. And this, I think, is predominantly because we now have more surgical options that require CT scanning, so the valves. And also, we're going to the lung cancer screening programs. Now, in America, those who would meet the criteria for lung cancer screening, which is basically 20 pack year history of smoking um, and uh, if you haven't, if you quit within the last 15 years, you can still, you're still eligible. And it's over 50 years of age in America. I believe in the U UK, it's over 55. So this is going to make a big difference to the amount of people that are probably diagnosed with COPD when and if this is rolled out fully. Uh, because obviously, these, these people who are going to be scanned are going to be also at very high risk of um, COPD. Other updates in the new guideline are a lot of information on vaccinations and COP has been updated. More table has been added with information on evidence supporting reduction in mortality. And there's a lot more information about the uses of inhaled devices and how important it is to ensure that your patient is using those correctly. So the vaccinations that are recommended, influenza, uh, COVID, a new pneumonia one, um, and even a vaccination to protect against whooping cough. There's some, there's a table that's telling us about the benefits of bronchodilators and giving us the evidence there that they're beneficial on FEV1 and symptoms if they're used regularly or as needed, SABA and or SAMA. And you know, you can read that table in your own time, but I I think you probably be aware of most of these already. As I say, there's a lot more 
interest and recognition of the importance of um, the need for the uh, accuracy of inhalers. And I think there's a lot of mention in the gold lines now about the viewing of patients. I mean, I don't know what happens anymore in the UK, but certainly over here in Spain, you're given a prescription. If you're diagnosed with COPD, you're given a prescription for medication. You go away and get that medication and you don't go back to your doctor. You don't see a nurse, you don't see a physio and you take it as best you can. And I always start my assessments with patients by assessing their inhaler use. And the number of people that will have at least one error is you know, phenomenal. <laughs> uh, there are also tables that tell us about anti-inflammatory agents, the use of different anti-inflammatory agents, uh, such as inhaled glucocorticoid or gluco or oral steroids, PD4 inhibitors, antibiotics, and mucoregulators and antioxidants. Even some information about other ones such as statins. Uh, we have a table that I think this is a particularly interesting table. This is a new table again. And this is looking at the evidence supporting a reduction in mortality with the pharmacotherapy and the non-pharmacotherapy. You can see this bar that gets in the way of it. I think this is super, super, super important, um, particularly because if you look at it, there's one, two, three, four, five non-pharmacological therapies that improve mortality in patients with COPD. I think that is really important for us all to, you know, remember that message. You've only got one medication route that improves mortality, but you've got five routes for pulmonary rehab uh, for other non-pharmacological therapies. Smoking cessation rehab, and in this case, the caveat is that it's um, if they've been hospitalized for exacerbations and it's, the rehab is delivered um, within four weeks of the discharge. There's also a nice slide looking at the overview of current and proposed surgical. As I said, there's more information on surgical interventions for people with COPD. I see um, a fair few people out here who've had coils or lung volume reduction surgery. Um, and a few people who are on the waiting list for um, lung transplantation as well, which is interesting. Lung volume reduction surgery, bolectomy, transplantation, bronchoscopy interventions, and some studies, uh, some studies highlighted here looking at the new denovation technology and uh, real plasticity and things like that. Again, we're back to pulmonary rehab. We know how important pulmonary rehab. We know that it improves dyspnea, health status and exercise tolerance, leads to reduction in symptoms of anxiety. Please, everybody, remember that education alone does not change behaviour. Education alone does not increase exercise tolerance. Education alone does not reduce dyspnea. Self-management, on the other hand, particularly self-management uh, with support from nurse, physiotherapist, someone like that, with healthcare support, and with medication provision does change and can reduce exacerbations. Uh, and telehealth has not shown uh, any benefit at this time. However, don't mistake telehealth with tele-rehab because we know that rehabilitation delivered online can have very similar benefits as rehabilitation delivered in um, a center. And certainly I see a lot of patients online and a lot of it is rehab approach online. We need to think about palliative care, hospice care. I think this is a hugely, um, badly, badly addressed area in COPD. Um, I have been involved in many studies looking at severe end-stage breathlessness, and I have been involved in working with those patients, and it, it breaks my heart that they don't get the palliative care services that they need. I think it can be tricky to refer patients to palliative care. I'll tell you a story that happened to me at one of the hospitals, a lady who was on NIV at home, overnight NIV, told me that she was very concerned about end of life, that she was very concerned that she wouldn't have the NIV at end of life, told me that she was very concerned about her breathing problem when she was actually dying and wanted to talk about the death that was going to come. So I said, would you like me to liaise with the palliative care team? And she said, yes. So I did. And then a few days later, I got a complaint put into me from the son 
who said that um, his mother was not going to die and I was not to be talking about death with her and I was not to be bringing in these palliative care team people who were just basically us who are, would upset her. And, um, so it can be difficult. <laughs> Um, I still think it's a really important area, though, and I think we should be considering palliative care support a lot more. Of course, it isn't that widely available, I know. Oxygen therapy and ventilatory support and stable COPD. Uh, we know, this is not new, we know this now, that if someone's severely hypoxic, yes, they need LTOT. If they're only moderately hypoxic with a little bit of arterial desaturation when they're moving around, then LTOT will not help them and that we need to do an individualized assessment in those patients as to the benefits of supplemental oxygen. Uh, NIV can improve hospitalization-free survival in selected patients. There's more about the non-pharmacological management, and please, we mustn't forget smoking cessation. We mustn't forget um, physical activity. In the RA group, we really need to I mean, pretty much these are, uh, at A group, we're talking about physical activity rather than pulmonary rehab. In your Bs and your Es, we're definitely looking at pulmonary rehab, as well as advice about physical activity. Uh, more non-pharmacological-ish benefits, uh, education and pulmonary rehab, or patients with relevant symptoms, particularly those at high risk of exacerbation, should get pulmonary rehab. And much more, like I said before, the uh, vaccinations, the need for nutritional support for patients who may be uh, malnourished, and also the palliative care and the hypoxemia issues. So we're looking at updates in chapter five. Uh, this, this chapter is particularly about exacerbations. Uh, and again, there's been a new definition of COP exacerbation. There's a new paragraph and a new figure on the classification of severity. Um, of exacerbation. There's a lot in chapter five about exacerbations. And um, I will be honest with you that th most of it is not new, which is why I did not include all of this chapter five new stuff uh, tables in this talk. But of course, you can go and look at the document and if nothing else, get yourself your pocket guide because those are fabulous to have in your car, in your handbag, whatever. A new definition now, uh, it's an event that's characterized by increased dyspnea uh, and or cough that worsens in less than two weeks, may be accompanied by tachynea or tachycardia, and is often associated with increased local and systemic inflammation. There are conf confounders uh, when you're thinking of somebody who's presenting with a COPD exacerbation, things that you will know need to be ruled out to make the differential diagnosis. Um, so you might be thinking pneumonia or pulmonary embolism, heart failure. I'm not a doctor, I'm a physio, but I think it's very tricky at times without the full invasive, um, without the full, uh, you know, echocardiography and chest radio things like that to really rule out heart failure and COPD because so many of them have overlap uh, heart problems as well as lung problems. Okay, uh, there are, there's a table, a very useful table telling you potential indications for hospitalization assessment. We're really looking at cyanosis and acute respiratory failure. We're looking at um, very severe symptoms. And we're also considering the home support because if there is no home support, those uh, symptoms may not have to be quite as severe as it would be if there's nobody there to care for them. You could be thinking about the management of severe, but not life-threatening exacerbations. So obviously there you're looking at supplemental oxygen, bronchodilators, maybe or steroids, maybe antibiotics when signs of bacterial infection are present. Uh, it's very nice in the gold guidelines, they talk about the importance of the color of the sputum. I mean, we all know the Bristol spares, that's a, well, the, the um, stopped, well, it stopped, well, it stopped it, yes. Uh, the sputum charts and the colours, but if you've got green or purine looking sputum, then that really is a very positive indication that there's bacteria there. Um, so these are the sort of things that you're going to be doing monitoring fluid balance, um, thinking about heparin. Now, this is another table that's going to tell you whether they actually need to be admitted. 
Um, again, we're going to be looking at very severe dyspnea changes in mental state confusion, um, persistent or worsening hypoxemia. I found this, I find this one very helpful. It's not necessarily a new guide, um, but I found this very helpful because I'm often asked by the doctors here to go and visit someone at home who's got an exacerbation. And then I'm pretty much the person making the decision as to whether to escalate the care into hospital. Um, and so, you know, I am assessing the dyspnea and I, I have to be honest, if there's any confusion, I always um, go, well, I go back to the GP anyway with a report, but if there's a worry, if I'm concerned, then that's when we get back to the GP and nearly always those people are, tend to be admitted. There are updates on chapter six, and this is predominantly about COPD and comorbidities. And there's also updates in chapter seven about COPD um, and COVID, of course. And again, this is a, it's a pretty comprehensive chapter seven with COVID, and it's very useful. Um, I've, only, I've only retained the highlights of it in this, but again, you can go back to the document and have a look in more detail. But of course, this, this new chapter really needed some work, after what happened. And um, as I say, there's 387 new references in the document. This is um, the management of, yeah, this is the management of COPD and, and suspected or proven COVID. You know, you're gonna need to do your testing. You might need to do some other investigations. You're gonna need to think about your COPD pharmacotherapy. Uh, continue your maintenance therapy unchanged. You may need to consider non-pharmacological therapy. Uh, certainly you want to think about protective strategies for the future, face coverings, vaccination. And then there's COVID-19 therapy that fortunately we now have some evidence um, for the effectiveness of antivirals, um, humidified oxygen or non-invasive ventilation, HFNT is humidified oxygen air mix. Uh, you may need to use mechanical ventilation, um, ensure appropriate post-COVID follow-up. And of course, that one is important. I think it's going to be less, in some respects, it may be less relevant for, C for the CFP patients because they're an older population in general. But certainly there are, you know, there are terrible, terrible problems with long COVID. Um, you know, my stepdaughter has long COVID and she's had it for almost coming up to three years now. And she's in a wheelchair and she's a 40 year old. Um, so, you know, there are some really big issues with long COVID. However, they do tend to be in the younger population. So that may not be the same, but certainly following up uh, with your patients who, who have COVID, who have COVID and COVID, is going to be a really important factor just to see that things are meant improving as they should. Uh, right, so just final slide. I've kept very well to time. I'm super impressed with myself. <laughs> we um, it, overall the guidelines are, as you can expect, superbly informative, very very useful, and very readable. And in particular, the um, pocket guide is very very readable. Um, I think that. You know, we've got to be familiar with the changes, we've got to be familiar, and I personally feel that the direction that the guideline is taking us in is the right direction in terms of uh, earlier diagnosis, recognising things like pre COPD, importance of different inhaler types and the use of inhalers, uh, the case finding issues and the need for smoking cessation. Non-pharmacological therapies are recognised fully, there's a greater focus in this guideline on the surgical interventions and on COPD and COVID. And we now have this simplified ABE assessment tool rather than the ABCD tool. Okay, so now let's um, go to questions. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for what was such an interesting presentation. I have been collecting some questions that have been appearing in the chat box. Um, so we'll just crack straight into it. Um, for other attendees, I can see that another one's just popped up. Please do um, type your questions in. We do have some time, about 15 minutes or so. So um, if you have anything that you'd like to ask Rachel, please do ask. So Rachel, the first question is, and please forgive my pronunciation, um, the pertussis vaccine, is this new or should we have been giving it with a pneumo and flu? I... 
cannot really answer that, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, but however, I think it's not new. Uh, it's something that's been around for quite a while, but I think the, the recognition is on the importance of vaccinations overall. Uh, but as a non-prescriber and not being involved with vaccinations, that's really not my place to sort of... That's fine. Um, thank you. So I've got a second screen with a question. So if I'm looking this way, that's why. Um, so we've got another one. What are the implications of pulmonary rehabilitation being considered as a treatment that reduces mortality? Well, I think they're quite big. I mean, already we have a problem with referral to pulmonary rehab. Uh, we have a problem with the uptake of rehab. We have a problem with enough services of rehab. And the criteria are that we need to get patients into rehab after an exacerbation within four weeks. And that's quite tough. Certainly when I manage the pulmonary rehab at King's College Hospital, we, we put in a pathway that would enable um, hospitalised patients to get early access to pulmonary rehab. But we needed many more resources in, and patients were very reluctant because they were so ill. You know, if you're ill in hospital and somebody's coming along and saying, oh, I've got an exercise program for you to do, it's hard to, um, <laughs> so there are big implications. There's going to be time implications, there's going to be money implications, and there's most definitely we're going to need to roll out, I think, a lot more online rehab delivery. Absolutely. Um, so, oh, also, um, if you'd like to ask Rachel a follow-on question from your question, please do put it in the, um, the Q&A. So, We've got, should we be accessing more palliative care services for patients with COPD? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my anecdote about that lady is unfortunate, but certainly we know that there are a number of things that can be useful, some as um, you're using a fan or an electric fan, probably a battery held fan. Um, obviously, morphine opiates can be very useful to help manage breathlessness. And I think that... Um, I think it's difficult because as therapists in particular, we're very focused on improving quality of life, improving, well, improving quality. Of, I think it's important to remember with palliative care, you can improve quality of life most definitely, but we're always trying to get people, we don't want those discussions with the patients and they are difficult discussions. And unfortunately, there are few palliative care services around available. Um, and I think, you know, we need to, be more mindful that they can be useful and start a um, start a conversation with your palliative care teams about admitting patients with COPD because the emphasis still is on cancer. Yeah. Um, another attendee has asked, is there a sort of pocket guide of exercises which are recommended in pulmonary rehab? Yeah, I just saw that. Uh, I don't know that there is. I will do a little bit of self-promotion here, though. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote, it's on the um, email, isn't it? I think the book, the book is called COPD, The Secret to Thriving with COPD. And this book was written with a friend of mine who's also a patient of long, with very, very severe COPD. And at the bottom, she's also a bit of a computer whiz. <laughs> and at the back, we have a whole chapter on all the exercises and pictures of the exercises that you need to do because she basically, she, had to fight to get into pulmonary rehab and she credits pulmonary rehab for saving her life and I think she's probably right you know she was sent home with an oxygen tank and a, and a hospital bed so there's that in that book but there are a lot of those pulmonary rehab um toolkit there's online if you just put in pulmonary rehab there are quite a lot of resources out there now in pulmonary rehab and they're online and they have a lot of documents and pictures and things like that mm. Um, actually, you've had an attendee ask um, if you could promote the name of your book. Uh, I, I've just sold the last one. <laughs> it's called um, The Secret to Thriving with COPD. And it's by myself and a lady called Dawn Lawson. Brilliant. We were not done yet. It, actually, it got, um, it got in the top three of best COPD help books for the Times. But mm. I, I know, it sounds good, but there can't be that many COPD self-help books, can there? Well, I didn't, I would never diminish your achievements, but no, I, know. I did wonder how many there might be. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I put it up there, yes, there. yeah. That's yeah. brilliant, yes, Emma's um, put a link into the, I believe it's the Amazon webpage where you can find the book. Um, so uh, we've got, how should we act on the new diagnostic 
criteria of PRISM or pre-COPD? Yeah, I mean, I think this is going to come about if, I mean, this is going to be very strongly related to case finding, because we're not going to pick it up unless we're doing case finding. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity for smoking cessation if the, if the patient is still smoking. There's nothing more powerful than saying to someone, look, actually, your lungs are already showing sign of deterioration. You've got small airway disease. You've got the beginnings of emphysema. And if you don't stop smoking, this is just going to get worse and worse. And that is exceedingly powerful. But also, of course, we can help people if we do pick it up early, we can help people understand the importance of exercise and help them understand the importance of having strong muscles and good nutrition, um, their diet. And in fact, I got referred to somebody the other day at the hospital and um, he didn't actually have COPD. Yeah, he was, pre he was um, prism. He would have been a prism patient because really he only had very little evidence of small airways disease because it was a case finding situation actually. The GP here, I'd done a CAT questionnaire with the patient, identified that they still smoked, asked me to come and do spirometry with them because they have a handheld kit. So I did the spirometry and I could say to him that you haven't got emphysema, you haven't got COPD at the moment, but you have got small airways disease and that is a sort of precursor. And he responded beautifully. We had two sessions over a um, three week period. He took on board all the exercises. He took on board the smoking cessation um, and he really recognised the importance of protein for his muscles and things like that. So I think it can can be really, really positive. Mm, that's wonderful. Actually, a, a delegate um, would echo your sentiments. In the chat box, they've written that um, before COVID, they started a group of consultations on COPD in our surgery, but did not follow up due to COVID. But they think that multidisciplinary approaches with dietitians for malnutrition can be really helpful too. Yeah, absolutely. It's, we're in a community of like-minded professionals. Um, so Melissa asks, if the steroid inhaler is taken away from the patient's inhaler regime, would you recommend the patient oh, has Enfolis checked regularly? You might need to look in the Q&A box for that. How do you spell it? E Oh, ease and fills. Yeah, I think having I think having the ease and fills checked regularly is going to be important. I I, do, I mean I do think that this, this ease and fill um, criteria recommendation is going to be a bit controversial with people. I mean, my sister has very severe asthma. We know she has, but it's not eosinophilic asthma. So actually, if you were taking ease fills as a reason for her to have inhaled corticosteroids, she wouldn't be taking them. Um, but she is on them because clinically she presents with, she clearly has severe asthma. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can be difficult and also these little levels can change quite markedly. So yes, they will need regular testing. And of course, I think if somebody is having exacerbations and as, it's, as that consideration says, you know, between 100 and 300 these are the fills, then, then perhaps um, you should try it. Hmm. It's going to be quite, it's quite a, it's a, it's a recognition of the damage and the side effects of corticosteroids, really. But it is a bit of a, a new approach. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I've asked all the questions that I've discovered in the chat box. Do you, um, this is the final pool of four questions. If there's anyone that would like um, to ask anything to Rachel, uh, this is your chance because um, I think that we've come to an end now. I'm going to start wrapping up. If a question does pop in, um, I'm happy to pause to make sure that we have everything answered. So, oh, as a new question. Oh, it was a thank you. That's very kind. So, yeah, thank you. Um, and actually in the footsteps, thank you so much, Rachel. It's been a really interesting hour um, and I've really enjoyed uh, hearing all about it. You can see the thank yous that are streaming in on the chat box, um, but I'm sure that everyone would like to say through their screens, thank you so much for your time.